My name is Melissa Chen. Thanks for joining us both in person and online. This In Conversation segment with Meredith Whitaker, president of Signal, will be led by Gideon Litchfield, the global editorial director of Wired. Beyond leading Signal, Meredith is also the current chief advisor and the former co-founder of the AI Now Institute. Her research and advocacy focuses on the social implications of artificial intelligence and the tech industry responsible for it, with a particular emphasis on power and the political economy driving the commercialization of computational technology. Enjoy the conversation. Hello, Gideon. Welcome to RightsCon. Thank you. I guess Thank you for this. having me. <laughs> so we're going to here to talk about Signal and about encrypted messaging and about AI and about all of the stuff that's going on in the world around the power of tech yes. and versus the power of the individual. Um, let's start with a really simple question because I think most people who are at RightsCon know what Signal is. There have been a lot, of encrypt uh, a lot of messaging apps in the last few years that have also adopted end-to-end -end encryption. So just for the basics, tell us what makes Sing Signal different. Well, Signal is a truly private communications app. We um, protect not only the contents of your messages using the Signal protocol, uh, but we also protect metadata, which you know I don't have to explain to a RightsCon audience why protecting metadata is so essential. Um, and we, you know, provide that in the form of a communications app that insofar as we're able meets the norms and standards of you know, messaging apps broadly. So it's useful, it's pleasant, it's fast, it's not asking you to sacrifice you know, kind of your habits of digital communication to, right. use, a, uh, you know, to use a truly secure and you know, austere version yeah. of a whole, messaging app. The point here is that you give away virtually, you, you generate uh, virtually no metadata yeah. at all about yeah. people's contacts. We right? don't, you know, we, of course the content, like what you say, mm. encrypted using the signal protocol, which is the standard for you know, messaging app, for encrypted messaging apps generally. Yeah. Uh, right. WhatsApp uses it, Facebook uses it, Messenger is, is deploying it, Google uses it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we have you know, created novel cryptographic approaches to also encrypt metadata. And I will just say this is extremely hard because we are operating in an ecosystem that assumes surveillance. It assumes collect it all. You know, it assumes that you are going to be monetizing surveillance in some way because of course that is the business model on which our problematic tech industry has been built. Right. Um, I'm just going to take a pause to remind people who are watching, listening, that if you uh, go, if you are at RightsCon and you have the QR code, you can go onto uh, the QR code on your badge. You can go there and check into the Slido app, which allows people to, allows you to pose questions that I can then see on the screen next to me here, and I can put to Meredith. And oh, cool. if you are not at RightsCon, you can go to the RightsCon website and also find the link to Slido, and it will tell you um, how to uh, pose questions. So there are all of these other apps, and the tricky thing is that people use, you know, what determines whether people use an app often is not how secure is it, yeah. it's are there friends there? Um, is it the common app that the networks use or yeah. that is favored in their country? So how do you work, f first of all, how do you think about the fact that there are now multiple apps also offering end-to-end -end encryption, albeit not as much uh, protection of metadata, is that, Net, net good, the fact that there's competition for Signal, and how do you reach an even broader range of people given that they have these options? Um, look, I don't, we're a nonprofit, right? Mm -hmm. We are not trying to get people to use Signal so that we can tell advertisers, you know, it's going to cost more because we have no more viewers of your ads. We're not trying to growth hack so people spend more time on the app. Like, we actually, you know, we're a nonprofit, it costs us more the more people use it because it's very expensive of course you know the, you know from hosting to labor to all of it it's an expensive endeavor however we do want to live in a world where everyone anywhere can pick up their device speak to anyone else anywhere easily using signal or signal technologies to you know 
have privacy be the default for human communication. So I don't I don't think a lot about, you know, there are other apps that are coming for us. Like ultimately if there were one app that actually had both the structural model that meant that, you know, we could trust them not to undermine privacy, very important. And we're using privacy preserving technologies that were validated and robust. I would be happy, right? Like my point is not to win the sort of competition and show that Signal is, you know, better than all of them. My point is that, you know, there are billions of people in the world, all of whom have the right to privacy, and we need something that is providing a mechanism for them to exercise that right. Because over the past number of decades, we've seen the default for communication go from private to surveilled by a handful of companies and governments kind of out from under us in a way that I don't think, um, you know, I think is extremely scary for our future. Yeah. Uh, you were in a session a little earlier today with some people from a, other encrypted messaging apps. Was, yeah. uh, and somebody there talked about this protocol called Mimi, the more, in, more instant messaging interoperability, which would allow people, allow people to use one messenger and see messages from another, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you talk, talk a bit about that and how, what do you, what do you think of the challenges and, and also potentially the benefits in putting something like that together? I mean, I get it, right? Um, it would be nice if, you know, Gideon, I picked up my phone and I, you know, you're using, I don't know, iMessage and I'm using Signal and we didn't have to think about it. Our message is just smoothly transacted. Yeah. Um, isn't that a lovely vision? That's not the world we live in. Um, and I would just say I'm, I am skeptical in part because one of my first roles at Google was working on standards. Mm -hmm. And standards are really hard to get right, mm -hmm. really, really hard to get right across a number of actors, even if all those actors want the standard to actually work. And now you have a number of actors who actually don't really want to interoperate. Like there's no way Apple wants to interoperate with Facebook, you know, et cetera. So I think, you know, I am, I'm in a wait and see approach to that, like I think it's a lot harder than some folks are sort of you know, making it out to be. Of course, the, the Mimi working group understands these challenges and is trying to move it forward. But I think you know, there are fundamental questions that I have around you know, how do you do interoperability when you are protecting metadata? How would we validate the back end system of a, you know, another messaging app to make sure that we're not sending you know, information that we promise the people who rely on us we protect over to them in a way that would compromise that protection. How right. do we validate all of that? Of course, WhatsApp is not going to open up all of their code. So, you know, how, like, how do we actually negotiate some of the, you know, difficulties at the technological and, you know, frankly, the business model level around mm -hmm. this? And I, you know, I'm again, wait and see, because I've seen it even under the best circumstances, this stuff can go sideways really easily. And this is not the best circumstances. Right. I want to talk a bit about some of the challenges that encrypted messaging is facing around the world, in particular when it comes to more authoritarian governments that might try yeah. to block apps like Signal. Yeah. Uh, and then there's also some legislation pending, particularly in Europe, that is threatening some of the, the questions of yeah. the, the ability to maintain encryption. So let's let's start with like individual countries or, or places where. It's, are there places where Signal has been either blocked, coming under attack? What do you do in those cases? And what can people who are relying on Signal in those countries do if they find that they lose access to it? Yeah, well, I mean, we do whatever we can, which is not everything, right? Yeah. We don't own the telco infrastructure. We are, you know, a small organization, but we, we take that very seriously. So, you know, mm -hmm. for example, when we were blocked in Iran, we put out a call to our community asking people to host proxy servers that would mm. you know help people, people in iran or outside people of outside of iran basically mm. you know so they block signal mm. so okay you're not going to signal you're going to a proxy server that masks where your traffic is going right. and then you can you know get to signal get to your messages that works for people who have signal installed already um mm. it doesn't work for people who need to install the app then because of right. course the telco is blocking the registration codes and there's all sorts of um you know, issues there. So we do what we can and we're, you know, again, we're committed. We recognize that authoritarian governments rarely represent the people who are governed by them and yeah. that everyone has a right to privacy. So, you know, if the UK blocks signal, we would do exactly the same thing. Um, we don't, you know, we, we our, our stance is pretty clear. Yeah. Okay. And let's talk then about the legislation. So there is this privacy bill or child safety bill in the UK. 
Um, and it's being, there seems to have been this shift, and this also came up in the session that you yeah. talked about earlier, that a few years ago, the, the, ad, the people who were arguing against encryption were worried about terrorism. Yeah. And today, there's a lot of worry about child sexual abuse material online. Yeah. And as you pointed out, that is a really, really bad problem, and it's a really hard conversation to have. Um, but what do you think is, what, what is at risk here? If, talk a bit about this bill. What's at risk here if it passes? Uh, and what are the arguments against it? So there, there's a bill in the UK, the online safety bill, which includes, you know, it's a, it's a kind of one of these omnibus tech bills, right? So it's a, there's a lot in there. Some of it is good. Some of it is, you know, who knows? And some of it is, frankly, terrible, like the provisions around encryption, which, you know, as they are written now, and this could change and we hope it change, um, could be used to mandate uh, what is called client-side scanning. So effective, you know, the client is your device, scanning is surveillance, and this would be a government mandated on device mass surveillance system that would scan every message you sent before you sent it using some kind of, you know, broken and scammy AI slash, you know, kind of paired with some database to determine whether your speech was permissible or not. And, you know, after they did that, okay, you can encrypt, but right, like they you fundamentally nullify the point of encryption and the point of privacy in the name of protecting children. Right. Um, and, you know, I think this is, you know, one, we have a lot, there is a lot of evidence that shows that there are moves you can make that mm -hmm. protect children who are in these monstrous situations, right? Yeah, talk a bit about that. What, what's the counter argument then to the, well, fact that you, the idea that you need to break encryption? You know, based on the exactly. research I've done and the you know, people who are on the ground advocating for protecting, you know, real children in real life who need mm -hmm. help now, not sort of, you know, bombast and surveillance, you know, it looks a lot like social services. It looks like educating children so they have the language to express themselves and to know what it, you know, what, when behavior is, is crossing a line. It looks like acknowledging the extraordinarily uncomfortable fact that the majority of abuse happens in the family. And when it doesn't happen in the family, it is perpetuated by, you know, people who are generally in a position of authority and tasked to care for children. So teachers, priests, et cetera. Right. So, you know, that is the context within which abuse happens and within which we need to help children, believe children and have support for, you know, getting children and often their, you know, mothers or caretakers out of abusive situation. And what you see in the UK, which is, you know, again, indicates to me that there's some level of deep cynicism behind this bill and the claim that it protects children, is that they have slashed early intervention services by 50%, funding mm. for these services by 50% over the last decade, even as they are sort of championing this unworkable, you know, magical thinking bill that would mandate mm. mass surveillance that would be hugely expensive. Standing up a system like that would be, you know, it would be a nightmare, but you're talking about billions of dollars, right? right. Um, that they're sort of justifying that on the basis of protecting children. So something isn't adding up. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we need to take that very seriously. Why do you think there is such appeal to these arguments that if we could just, in, you know, in, uh, in, uh, sorry, if we could just implement this surveillance system that allows us to sidestep encryption, we'd solve the child, child abuse problem. Why, why is there so much faith in all of this? I don't, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I think easy solutions are really calming. Mm. Um, I think <clears throat> we it's also- It's a kind of a tech solutionism. Isn't it, it is a tech solutionism. It's, you know, again, it's much harder to look in the eyes, the fact that well, fuck, we live in a world that allowed the Catholic Church to cover up child sexual abuse for years and years, even though multiple people knew about it. That's a very difficult, you know, cultural phenomenon to actually face and acknowledge. It's much easier to abstract this online, say it's an online problem, use online as the prefix, you know, every time we talk about it, and then say, like, well, since it's online, you know, my scammy, you know, client-side scanning company can provide you the perfect solution. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot going on there. And I also think there is a persistent never going away will from those in you know, certain positions of power, particularly in law enforcement, to get access to any data they don't have access to, to gain the right to surveil at a very personal level. And that these, these emotional issues that people don't want to look in the face are very good pretexts for that kind of drive. Right, so child protection is kind of the Trojan horse issue then for yeah. law enforcement to gain access to everything. I think, in, I think 
there is a lot of that going on. I don't want to say that everyone who is sort of pushing this or everyone who believes this is somehow like a cynical actor using this as a pretext, mm -hmm. but I cannot look at, you know, slashing early intervention support by 50%, then claiming that, you know, that you're protecting children by sort of, you know, uh, advocating for an unproven, unworkable, magical thinking mass surveillance system. Like those two things tell me that at least some of the actors here recognize this as a cynical ploy. Yeah. You and I have talked in the past about the notion of privacy and why we need to keep on defending mm -hmm. it, despite the fact that we seem to be losing it more yeah. and more. Can you run through that argument when, you know, when the amount of data that's being collected about people and just skimmed off of the internet in general and fed into AIs and, and you know, used and collated all the time seems to be growing exponentially. It almost feels as if the amount of information that we can protect by using encrypted apps, messaging apps like Signal is shrinking almost as a proportion of what can be known about us. So is, is that a losing battle? What's, what's the argument for continuing to fight that? Well, nothing's a losing battle if you ultimately win. <laughs> so I'm going to keep fighting. Um, and I don't, you know, no, because specificity matters. Question, you know, privacy is not just sort of a, it's not a, it's, it's not, not a monolith, right? The, right. You know, like it's even not like Signal. It's like a three percent privacy or two percent like, privacy or five percent, right? Signal is a privacy app, but what is it actually doing? It's a communication service, right? Yeah. It, it is at least one other person. You know, like you are saying, I want this to be private from everyone but you, right? I want to actually share this with you. So it's a way of sharing with integrity, is my view, right? And it, you know, it is like choosing who you communicate to, choosing who gets to be, you know privy to your thoughts or your, you know, intimate expressions or your, you know, working through an idea that is a little vulnerable at that time. And mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, for me, this is about power, right? right. It's private from whom? Mm -hmm. And we know, we know throughout history that, you know, those in power love to use an information asymmetry for social control to yep. signal, at, single, signal out, single, sorry, single I got out. signal on the brain, <laughs> single out, you know, others for persecution to, yep. you know, this is you know, information asymmetry is a classic tool of those in power that is used to oppress. And, you know, surveillance is kind of a byword for the techniques that are used to construct an information asymmetry. But it, you know, it does matter what, right? Like being mm -hmm. able to protect the conversations you're having if you're labor organizing at your job or the conversations you're having with a source who's, you know, whistleblowing, you know, sensitive information. That's not trivial simply because, you know, the ratio of protected to unprotected is, you know, getting more lopsided, right? That is still existentially important to real human beings. Yeah. I want to digress briefly for a question from the audience. Um, Anonymous asks, when my contacts join Signal, I get push notifications on my device telling me they've joined. Does that present a possible security or privacy risk for them? Um, it could appreciate that issue. And it's actually, we, we have the option to turn that off now, so. Okay, yeah. thank you. I hope you got your answer anonymous. Um, you, in particular, have been a very public face for Signal, and it feels like, you know, the, for a long time, well, for some years, the focus was on just building a secure encrypted yeah. app. And since the Signal Foundation was created in 2018, and then since you joined, it's become much more of an advocacy organization. Like, you are going around, you're talking eh. about this stuff. You eh. don't think so? I, it's not an advocacy organization, right? It's a, mm. you know, we are a tech organization whose mm. primary focus is developing, caring for, maintaining, you know, the Signal app across mm. multiple platforms. It is also an organization that because our mission is so focused on privacy is increasingly threatened by, you know, these um, noxious laws and other mm. kind of anti-privacy anti -privacy zeitgeists. Um, mm. And I would say that it is also threatened by the continued amplification of the AI hype, right? Yeah. Um, which, you know, I think is actually like, why that has anything to do with Signal isn't obvious at first glance, mm -hmm. but of course AI requires huge amounts of data. So it's sort of, you know, it is a surveillance derivative as I've called it. It requires huge amounts of compute. So these are things that only a handful of centralized companies have. So it, it trends toward the type of consolidation that makes this type of you know, mass surveillance even more dangerous because you only have a handful of actors um, often closely connected to various governments. Um, and AI itself is a surveillance technology. 
-hmm. So when I'm walking down the street and I am judged by an AI system, whether that's pseudoscience or not, and in most cases it is, right? There's no you know correlation between my gait and my character. Nonetheless, there are many systems that will claim there are and that will create data about me that could have serious implications for my life, for my access to opportunities and resources based on that data. So we have to recognize that these are, you know, these both consume surveillance and produce surveillance and that the way AI is being marketed is as some kind of magical new technology. And that, that marketing of magic, that you know, having Sundar come on 60 Minutes and claim that AI just kind of learned a new language that wasn't in the, in the data, or having, you know, as I mentioned in the last section, Mark Zuckerberg flatly lie about the capabilities of AI technologies to handle content moderation without human intervention. Like those are things that set us up for a world where we can kind of understand why politicians believe that client side scanning would somehow magically be able to both preserve privacy and conduct mass surveillance. And so I think we need to be, you know, we need to be out there clarifying these things. We need to be, you know, speaking out for the requirement for privacy because we, there is a threat to our core mission, which is you know, building this robust, truly private communications app if we don't step into those debates. But of course, yeah. like our, you know, that is in service of our core mission. It is not an expansion into advocacy. Yeah, okay, I, I see the distinction, but I think you, you have been out there drawing that connection that, as you say, is not very obvious yeah. between yeah. this notion of privacy to secure communication on the one hand and mass surveillance on the other and you know it's some um, watching the debate that is or i don't know if debate is even the right word let's just say the noise yeah. around generative ai the over the last <laughs> <laughs> over the last few months you know it's it's been interesting how the people warning about the risks of ai have sort of seemed to have fallen into roughly two camps and their one camp is often led by the, the creators of, of AI or the creators of big tech, who are the ones who warn of apocalypse, uh, and, and, but also in the same breath, talk about how amazing AI could be yeah. um, and how it could solve so many problems. And then there are other people like you who've been working at the coalface of uh, responsible tech and AI ethics and issues like that for a number of years, who are concerned with the more immediate day-to-day -day risks, such as misinformation, mass surveillance, like of privacy, um, bias, um, and maybe the fact that these two camps have emerged is not surprising given, given, given who is in them. But does it feel, it feels to me almost as if the, I'm not sure if this is turning into a question or just a, a statement now, but um, it feels as if the people who are warning of the great risks are also maybe setting it up so that they can claim they saved us from those great risks when it turns out that AI did not in fact enslave us. Yeah, everyone loves the feeling of being a hero. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I, I mean, I agree that you were mm. seeing kind of a cleave. I think mm. we're seeing, um, I think the narrative around sort of existential risk, it, it, you know, mm. there's a, there's a lot here because there's actually sort of a history, you know, these, these camps didn't just emerge from nowhere. They're actually, you know, there's some folks who believe there's an existential risk for much more grounded reasons than others who just believe that somehow corporate technologies are going to spin up and become sentient and we have to, you know, deal with them on their own terms. So there's, you know, there's a lot of muddiness here. But in short, I think at least part of this kind of quick turn to reframe the risks mm -hmm. as sort of far in the future, kind of vague apocalyptic existential risks is an attempt to stave off much more practical regulation, mm -hmm. right? Because you, if you, you know, you regulate the problems you see. And if you reframe the problem to be like, there's a Terminator in 2040, and right now we have to sort of think about how we prevent that, you are, you know, effectively erasing a lot of the, you know, other framings of problems which are like, hey, AI is a technology that emerges out of significantly centralized control, uh, you know, monopolistic control in this industry. It's ceding significant power to a handful of private actors who are always going to modify these systems based on their incentives, which are, of course, you know, increasing profit and growth forever. And that is, of course, not always commensurate with the, you know, social good, particularly with ensuring that these systems aren't being both sort of 
embodying or, or kind of replicating in their own logics, you know, histories of marginalization and being used to, you know, further oppress the populations they're used on, whether those are Amazon warehouse workers or people crossing borders or what have you. So, you know, mm -hmm. that is obviously the frame that I, you know, my analysis leads me to believe, but the frame of, you know, you say like, don't, don't, we don't have time to pay attention to that. The risk is so significant. It is terminators. It is, you know, AI sort of growing its own brain. It is, you know, whatever it is, we have to focus on that. That is what is really important. You mm. have effectively <clears throat> reshaped the regulatory frame and, you know, to something that is much easier to hollow out, that is much easier to claim that only those who are sort of the technologically elite are mm. even capable of understanding how to regulate, like the kind of sycophantic moments during the um, congressional hearing with Sam Altman, where one of the, you know, Congress people was like, hey, Sam, could you lead the agency to regulate. So I think, you know, I also think, and this is not a point new to me, mm -hmm. that overstating these harms, sort of, you know, claiming that these systems are going to cause apocalypse or, you know, become sentient or superhuman is a incredibly good advertisement for these systems, right? Which military doesn't want to license superhuman APIs from a company called Microsoft, right? right? So you're, you know, you're overstating it. And and then again, this is the kind of magical thinking that teaches the public they should also believe client-side scanning can do things it can't, that sh teaches the public to believe there are sort of magical technological solutions for problems that don't have them. So. Right. I think it's uh, your point there that having this, uh, talking about the fantastical capabilities of AI as a way to distort regulation away, away from where it should focus, yeah. I think that is really crucial. At the opening ceremony of RightsCon, I said a maybe kind of Pollyanna-ish thing, um, which was, on the one hand, it's a, I find it scary that there's, you know, these tools, these new AI tools are spreading at an unprecedented rate, pushed by very, very powerful companies. Uh, but on the flip side, I feel like we're having a much less naive conversation as a society about technology than we were 15 years ago, let's say, with the rise of social media. And that civil society, at least, is much better informed than it used to be. And even lawmakers are starting to get better informed than they used to be. But uh, does that, I don't know, does that ring too optimistic to you? I think that's true, right? Mm -hmm. I think most people are skeptical of large tech companies. Most people recognize that there's sort of a, you know, real issues with the types of power we've ceded to these companies. And, you know, there's certainly a lot more a lot more understanding of the material realities of these systems than I encountered, you know, 10 years ago, for sure, even five years ago. Mm -hmm. I do think, you know, I think kind of building on that, we can look at these sort of ungrounded claims that constitute the sort of AI hype moment we're in, you know, like, you know, it's, it's you know, sparks of consciousness or, you know, mm -hmm. the super intelligence. And we can recognize also an attempt to sort of um, revive a type of naivete, right? Mm -hmm. You know, to, you know, dis again, distort people's understandings of how these systems work. Something that, you know, I think academics, civil society folks, and, you know, some tech workers have done a lot of work over the past decade to, you know, kind of expose the reality of these systems, right? And there's, mm -hmm. again, there's a, you know, I think a, a, among some parties, not everyone, but a, a kind of will to aphasia, if it were, and a will to re-narrate technology as a, once again mystified, once again sort of synonymous with scientific progress, and once again sort of beyond the understanding of the mere mortal. Do you have any advice for people who might be watching this who are themselves involved in tech policy issues, tech and civil rights, who have to go and talk to people who make policy, to lawmakers and regulators? advice on how they can educate them about these issues? What sorts of things work well? Well, I mean, I think most of the folks who are listening to this probably have advice for me, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm not in these rooms with lawmakers every day, although I've d certainly done a bunch of policy advocacy and I, I, have, um, mm -hmm. I have familiarity with that. Like, I think the advice will vary by jurisdiction. It will vary by, you know, the kind of political economic forces that are working. Um, I would, you know, Try to map how many, you know, who is your opposition, right? Mm -hmm. How many lobbyists is Google, Facebook at all paying? You know, what is the messages they're getting? You know, look at whatever Andreessen Horowitz is sort of publishing. It's going to be the like apex of the hype. So that's kind of a, a good, a good tip. And um, right. and you know, call it out. I don't, I, I mm -hmm. you know, but I think 
you know, if we're talking to the folks in this room, they're already doing a very good job of that. The issue is not, it's not only education, is that we're outgunned on resources and that there is a significant incentive to sort of sell this hype, right? If we yeah. look at, you know, like, how do VCs get valuations? It is via hype, right? Like, or how do, you know, how do, how do startups mm -hmm. kind of attract VCs who will then lead to like an inflated valuation that will end cash out with an IPO or an acquisition or whatever. It's, you know, by maintaining this hype until they can all catch up, right? So there's, there's, there's more happening here than a kind of like ecstatic confusion. Right. We are out of time. <laughs> Meredith. Oh my God. I know, so fast. How'd that happen? <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Meredith. <laughs> Thank this you, Gideon. This was a great conversation. Oh, great. Wonderful. Yeah.